Welcome to the RC3. Liebe Teilnehmer am RC3, ich darf euch jetzt den Festi vorstellen. Er hat ähm, in seinem Projekt Boxes PY was entwickelt, was ziemlich cool ist, um verschiedene Boxen und Kisten zu generieren, die ich danach einfach mit dem Lasercutter ausdrucken kann. Und zwar so, dass ich die äh, ausgeschnittenen Stücke dann einfach nur noch zusammensetzen muss. Aber für die Details übergebe ich jetzt einfach mal an Festi. Äh, freut euch auf Boxes PY. Hello. So, let's talk about. Uh, hello. Do I have do I have sound? Okay, let's assume I have sound. Um, let's talk about laser cutters and what to do with them. Because let's start with the most important thing. Laser cutters are amazing. From all the proto from all the rapid prototyping stuff. They are, in my mind, the most worthwhile machines for uh, hacker spaces or maker spaces. For me, the main selling point is their speed. They can do stuff quick. So if you have something that's like box size thing, you can do that within minutes, like 10 minutes or something, where 3D printing always takes hours or days, depending on how big the uh, thing is. The second thing is laser cutters are very, very precise. We will see how precise they are, but they can easily um, produce um, precision within a couple of hundreds of millimeters, which is something 3D printers can't do and, well, milling machines can do, but they have a lot of other difficulties to achieve that. And they are inherently 2D, which means they're easier to understand and easier to use. Basically, all you need is a 2D drawing and a laser cutter can use that. While many true 3D machines need complicated tool paths and you need a tool chain that actually is able to deal with that. And so um, in our hacker spaces, while the introduction to laser cutter is about one hour long, but after that you can just use the machine easily. That, so how do they work? Basically, they work great. If you have a bit of a, a closer look, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's so much smoke uh, and mirrors that you need some fume extraction. And um, that's a bit of a problem, but it's doable. Um, if you look even closer, you see a lot of scary things that are in this huge box. And there's a nice mix of, of uh, fragile glassware water and high voltages. So when you look at, take a look at close, it's even more scary than just lasers. Um, and of course, uh, those uh, relatively cheap and affordable uh, laser cutters are using CO2 lasers, which are invisible. So even the danger that is from the laser is invisible. Um, and the laser is strong enough to make stuff disappear. So laser cutters look very, very scary. And, but in reality, they're not as bad as they look or sound like. Because the whole laser stuff is all included, is all enclosed in this box, which is uh, made of steel. And if you get a good laser cutter, which is class one, it's basically at the same uh, class as a CD-ROM drive which is basically says there's a laser, but it's inside and can't get out. The thing we need to be careful is if you do stuff you shouldn't or do repairs. So then be careful. Otherwise, it's actually a pretty nice machine. All the difficult and dangerous parts are on the inside. Um, and if you do, don't do anything stupid, there's very little chance of you um, getting hurt. So. I'm much more worried about other tools in our hacker space like circular saws or hammers or um, um, 
just normal electricity out of the outlet that people plug into some weird apparatuses. The only thing that this actually requires care is that the laser cutter also always tries to burn your house down. The laser basically evaporates the material it cuts and basically creates a flame, a small fire instantly all the time. And just a small air pump that basically blows out those this fire all the time. So the only thing you really, really, really need to take care of is watching your laser cutter all the time. You really can't like leave it unattended. But if you do that, you should be all fine. It's all good. So what can laser cutter do? It can cut stuff. We will talk about what exactly in a minute. Um, and as an alternative, you can, if you dial down the power and speed it up, you can also score uh, um, the surface of a material. So you can scribble on that or put, put markings on that. It's also very useful. There's on the internet, I've seen people are using this uh, to bend acrylic with heat, but I've not done this myself. Um, the trick here is that the laser is uh, focused in one point. And if you move your material out of this point, uh, the, f uh, the focal gets bigger again. And so you can spread the heat on a bigger surface and it can be used to heat stuff, but it's kind of hacky. Um, so only hackers might want to use that. Um, then there's a whole world of stuff that uh, about engraving. It basically scans lines over the surface and you can then uh, score or fill whole areas for um, adding like a text or something like this. Um, you can even do dittering. So there's some software chain involved to prepare the images. So this looks good, but it can be done. And there are also a couple of cool specialty stuff that can be used. One of them is uh, dual layer acrylic, which is basically acrylic with a very thin layer and a second color on top, which can be etched off. So you have a two color um, uh, sign, for example, uh, as a result. And we also have some uh, special laser rubber that allows to do stamps, which is always a nice thing to have. When it comes to materials, uh, the main thing we are using is, uh, is plywood, typically birch or um, poplar, which is relatively light, which has cutting because the, the laser cutter needs to uh, evaporate and burn the material. So the more dense and more thick the material is, the slower the cutting goes. For a typical two or th uh, three or four millimeter uh, plywood, you can cut with like 30 millimeters a second. So it's quite quick. You have to be careful. There's one kind of uh, dark glue that's uh, used for um, uh, birch plywood sometimes that can't be cut. Uh, it's just uh, made of a material that won't evaporate and won't burn. And so you, you, no matter how powerful your laser is, it won't go through there. I had to learn that uh, the hard way. Another thing that that's uh, not that common, but it's really nice is leather. Leather is it's, it's very easy to cut, and you can uh, cut in holes to sew them into uh, complex shapes. Uh, make sure it's actual leather, um, or if it's some sort of uh, artificial material, you have to check that uh, same caveats as the for other plastics apply here. Acrylic is a uh, the plastic to cut with a laser cutter because it cuts really, really nicely. Um, it can also be cut deeper than all other materials because when cutting, the, the surfaces are reflective, so they refocus the beam into the cutting area. So um, you can cut even deeper than your beam would normally be able to, uh, to reach. There are a couple of other, other plastics that can be cut. You need to be really careful so there are no halogens, especially chlorine in there. So PVC is something you sh really shouldn't cut because uh, it creates uh, um, this is, uh, an acid that will damage the lungs and even worse, it damages the machine. So you really don't want that. So you can, uh, there's, there's a flame test you can do to test for chlorine. And if the um, flame gets green, you really shouldn't. Uh, used the materials. There are a couple of um, materials that can be cut, but most of them don't cut as nicely. Um, 
as acrylic. So they have the tendency to melt and then the molten material is blown over the edge and you have small droplets on the bottom and stuff like this. Um, the thinner the material is, the less this matters. If you have th thick material, there's a lot of uh, molten stuff coming out of the of the cut. And so um, your mileage may vary. It's possible to engrave glass. The glass, uh, when hit with the laser cutter, um, cracks on the surface, so it gets um, uh, mated. And um, so you you can even uh, make a small impression uh, with, with enough power. So it, you can put, uh, for example, uh, letters or, or, or some, some image on there. Um, the same is true for metals, but it's very uh, inconsistent. It depends a lot on the chemistry of the metal itself. So we had a couple of really good results with uh, stainless steels. Uh, but some other steels just won't uh, take a color at all. Um, there's also some uh, spray-on uh, color that you can burn onto metal, but uh, it's pretty expensive. Um, so you have to try what works or what doesn't. One can try to put oil on the surface and, and burn this into the metal to get some blackening effect similar to normal blackening of, of metal, but it depends a lot on the on the type of metal you're actually dealing with. So it's worth trying. So this is a talk on its own, but I'm just adding it here quickly. So if you have, don't have a laser cutter and think they're too expensive, uh, machines like ours, if they're um, upgraded to European standards, so they're really true class one lasers and are safe, they are pretty expensive. They can be around one, uh, about 10,000 euros. So if you surprisingly don't have that money and don't want to put some uh, CCC funding into that, uh, what we did is we took a credit from our members. We charge per minute. We love, have lowered the price since we uh, now, but in the beginning we, had, we charged 50 cents per minute the machine actually run. Whenever someone needs someone else to laser for them because they can't operate the machine or they're an external uh, customer. Uh, we pay the operator another minute. So they, if they work for one minute, they have one for their own. And of course that needs to be paid by the person that, that uh, uh, wants to have their stuff cut. And we charge another 50 cents just for good measures for external people who don't uh, uh, contribute to the rent of the room and electricity bill and anything else. Um, and we, then we, so that's a way to refinance your laser cutter. Um, the question is how do you motivate the people, your people to actually um, put that much money on the line? And what we uh, came up with is just paying interest in laser minutes. This is a great benefit that it doesn't cost um, the, um, uh, uh, hacker space any money and laser minutes are easy to produce and still with uh, 50 cents per minute it's easy to to come up with a um, interest rate that's very very competitive compared to like banks and we allowed uh, paying back the the loans within uh, 10 years on the terms of the hackerspace, which worked very, very great. After three years, we were able to pay everything back. Um, and so we were able to lower our rates after that. So if you need help with that, uh, contact me after that. So back to actual laser cutting. The difficult... Uh, thing with laser cutting is that they are 2D and the question is uh, while the Congress is in 2D, most of us live in 3D and so you want something that's not flat. And there are basically two ways of doing that. Let's say two and a half. The easiest one is just cutting multiple layers and stacking them on top of each other. That's something I'm not doing a lot but it's something that's very interesting for if you want to do something with circuit boards, for example, you often can just have one plate on top, one 
plate on the bottom and just have spacers in between that holds your circuit board. And it's probably that's for good enough for many applications. Um, the trick here to use is uh, to make holes uh, for alignment pins. You can just use some nails in there, or you can laser cut a piece of wood that you slot in, or you can have some kind of C-clamps that uh, sandwich the, the, the stack of, uh, uh, of layers. And the trick is that these, these help while gluing the stuff together. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to align stuff because if you have a lot, of, if you don't have enough glue, it's not uh, it's not holding very well. If you have too much, things start sliding around. So, alignment pins is a, is a trick and it's easy to add. So many things here you can just use Inkscape, click to take together uh, the basic shape, copy them a couple of times, and then cut away what 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 space you need inside. Um. The other obvious uh, solution is to just use finger joints and some box-like truss structures. That's what we are talking about uh, in this talk, mostly. So what's the problem? The problem is I, I had a laser cutter. We were buying one in my old hackerspace, and, but I was looking for a, a box generator. And um, it was uh, 2013, so a lot of software projects that look better now, like uh, FreeCut, weren't still that great. Um, I was looking for an open source solution, something that would be fun to code, something that would um, be able to deal with different material thicknesses that would do curve correction, so would, would uh, account for the amount of material that's removed from the, with the, uh, by the laser. Um, I urgently wanted to do flex cuts. We'll just see how they look like. They're basically making stuff, making wood bendy by cutting it a lot. And of course, wanted finger joints. And it turned out there wasn't a great solution there. So I started boxes.py. Um, I implemented in Python. It basically is a huge uh, turtle graphics project. So it's basically just you start in one corner, go along the edge, turn 90 degrees, do the next edge, and repeat until you're back where you were before. And uh, repeat it for all parts. So it's conceptually really, really simple. And that's on something, a uh, strength of the project. On the other hand, it, it limits what can be done reasonably. So there's no huge graphics engine that can, where you can like cut one shape out of another or something like this. Um, but it's basically just go along, turn, 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 be back where you were. So for everything that's like made of rectangles or simple shapes, that's really, really fine. If you do something complicated, it's probably not the right tool. Um, and there are a couple of generators that, that come against that edge uh, already. Back then, I was basing it on Cairo, libcairo, that's, that's the graphic libraries from um, uh, from GNOME, but it has been replaced. There's a command line interface, that's, that's how it started. There's now a web interface, which we look at in a minute. And it's now even available uh, as Inkscape plugin, so you can generate a box right away in Inkscape. There are now about uh, over 100 different generators. We will look at a few of them now. That's the web interface. It's not great. I'm not a graphics designer. I'm also not a web designer. I'm happy that it does something. Um, there are a lot of generators in each of these points that can be opened. And this is the interface for generating a box, basically. They all have the same layout. Um, on the very top, with the uh, arrow going to the right, there are settings for different um, edge types. In this type, only finger joints are used here. So there's only one. You can open that. Um, we'll look at the details um, later on. Then there's the section with the per generator uh, parameters. So there's the different sizes. Many of the boxes have an outside uh, checkbox where you can decide whether the measurements are for the inside of the box. So if you want to fit something in there, or if they're on the outside of the box, if you want to fit the box inside something. A lot of boxes do have uh, 
the ability to change the edge type on top or bottom will look at those edges types in examples. And they may have a couple of other feed, uh, other parameters. In this case, um, um, we can decide how many walls are there on the side, how, how, how many angles there are, and we can decide if we want to top uh, a lid basically or not. And on the bottom, there's the default settings, which we look at at a bit bigger. Those are something, so some of them are really important and you need to take care of them every time and some are not that important. The really important is the thickness. This is about the thickness of your material. I strongly advise to always measure your material before putting it in the laser cutter because many materials don't always come in the size that they are supposed to be. So uh, plywood swells and, 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 and shrinks. Um, although that's not that critical because it can be forced into uh, its nominal dimensions, but uh, especially acrylic is very brittle and it, it, if it doesn't fit, it won't fit. And you really don't want to use a file to, to, re, uh, um, to enlarge all the holes yet that you just cut. So do measure the thickness and um, check twice every time. So you can uh, select different formats. Default is uh, SVG, which uh, depending on the program you're using to use your laser cutter may be a good choice or not. It also can do D DXF, which is the second popular uh, format. Um, the second really, really important um, value is on the bottom, which is burn or AK curve. This is how much the laser um, is outset to account for the thickness of the cut. This needs to be pretty precise for things to fit. And I typically change this in 200th of a millimeter. So it can be 0.1 or point or 0 0.08, or if you want a looser fit, 0 0.06. The problem is this all depends on your machine and on the material used. And might might even change with, with the, if you're using different speeds and powers a, a little bit. So it's something that needs to be tried out or you need to have experience with that. There's a, a tool that we are just looking at for, for checking for train for checking this. So there are a few more stuff here that's not that important. There's the tabs, um, which allows you to, to leave small gaps in the cuts so, feet, so pieces don't fall out. That in my, is useful if you want to keep all your pieces within uh, your sheet of uh, material. Um, that's supported by most parts. There might be some hand programmed stuff that's not supporting them, but most places do support them, so pieces keep stay in. Um, this is also very critical if you want to want the pieces to pop out easily. Otherwise, you need to cut them. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2 uh, is a good value there. And even if you have one point one millimeter too much, it's really hard to get pieces out, especially smaller ones. Um, but you can cut it with a knife if, if you need to. Debug allows you to uh, put uh, boxes around uh, specific features to check alignment. That's only something you need if you're actually programming new generators. And there's the reference, which, is, which renders a 100 millimeter reference to make sure your drawing has the right scale because a lot of um, tools mess up the scale of your uh, of your drawing because both uh, uh, SV, SVN, SVG, and uh, uh, DXF don't really come with a built-in measurement system, but they have just numbers and different tools have different ideas what they exactly mean. Um, so if you're new, you may want to keep this. If, you're, if you have your tool chain established and you're confident that everything works fine, you can also set it to zero and it will disappear. And you won't need to just uh, delete it before actually cutting. 
So on the bottom, there, here is now no image, but if there's an image, uh, it will be of the finished product. Well, an example image of, of the product uh, will be shown here, and there might be uh, building instructions. But to be honest, there are very, very few generators that come with them. So if you want to write some, open a ticket, I will add them here. Uh, at the bottom, you can uh, choose a language. It's actually, uh, it currently is um, uh, translated to, uh, it is in English, it's translated to French and Chinese right now by contributors. So here's the burn test, which allows you to check different fits. Um, I need to speed up a bit. So there are a couple of different boxes. I've just put a couple of images here um, for examples. On the top uh, left is the one we've seen before. Uh, that's the angled box. The important thing is on the bottom right, which is the universal box, which is a normal box, but you can change the top and bottom edge uh, and allow to add a lot of different features to this uh, to the box. Um, one thing that's that's worth uh, knowing is per uh, edge setting per edge type, there's a, there are settings that can be adjusted. Um, this uh, is not that it's it's not really intended to adjust everything, but there are a couple of things that are useful. So uh, the angle is something you should leave alone because it's typically set uh, programmatically to to something useful. Um, there are uh, different styles. There's a style that has small uh, springs to make it easier to uh, uh, assemble and disassemble uh, the, the finger joints. Um, the stuff that's in really interesting to change is, is the fingers and the space, which is basically width of the fingers and the space in between. This is a bit weird at first because these are in multiples of the material thickness. That means if the fingers are of size one and the space of size one, all fingers are basically little squares. And the default is to have uh, them rectangular, one thickness high, two thicknesses wide. Um, another thing that's worth adjusting is the surrounding spaces, which gives how much space is, needs to be left on the left and right outside. The, the two is actually pretty nice. It means basically one space on each side needs to be, uh, one complete space needs to be on the left and the, and the, and the right. But if you have a very tiny um, box or a, a tiny part, that means that you don't have any fingers at all. So it might be worth reducing this to like one or one half uh, to get this one finger that keeps your parts together. Um, so these three are actually the one you you should have in mind, if you don't like your box, um, you can adjust the width of the fingers and the spaces and the surrounding spaces. And that's basically all you need here, really. Many of the other settings can be ignored if, unless you have good reasons to play with them. Same for most other uh, um, edge types. So here are a, a sample of the flex boxes which was one of the first thing I wanted to do. Um, in retrospect, they're kind of a gimmick. So it might work better. I, the, the current default setting are very, very flexible. They might be a bit better working if they were a bit um, wider and, and, and uh, sturdier. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice gimmick, basically. It takes quite a long time to cut because there are a lot of uh, lines to be cutting. Um, I'm relatively proud of the one in the uh, bottom uh, right, which is which actually works. Uh, so you can slide on this the, the, the lid and it disappears underneath. Um, unfortunately, the photo doesn't show it. So there's a second bottom on the, uh, underneath. So it actually really disappears and you can put something in there. So let's come to the really useful stuff. This is uh, trace and draws. Um, uh, you can either on the bottom uh, left, there's something you can put into a drawer. Um, 
you might want to uh, adjust it by by hand with with Inkscape or something if you have a draw that's not perfectly square. Um, there's not really something to to do that within a generator. Um, on the outside, on the outside right, there is uh, the type tray generator which allows you to uh, give all the distances uh, between those walls and. Uh, on the left, there's an extended version of this where you can not only give the distances you want for those walls, but you can also uh, basically delete single walls. The interface is a bit, um, let's say, archaic. It looks like this, uh, scaled up. So it's a basically a text uh, uh, area where you can add those numbers, and then you can delete those um, the single lines that represent those walls and those walls will just not be rendered. So you can do more complicated setups like this. Then there are a couple of shelves, uh, which are also uh, yeah, useful. Um, the Rhine rack is actually just around the corner. Um, the, the middle, um, shelf is, is the one in our hackerspace kitchens to have all kind of uh, spices. Um, and the two on the left are actually uh, contributions from, from third parties that had needs and submitted their generators. Um, those shelves are actually in use at a lot of places. This is our snack bar in our hackerspace. With uh, it's a bit difficult to see on the pictures, but those uh, those um, shelves are slanted forward, so stuff will uh, slide to the top, uh, to the forefront. And of course, we had to do all kind of uh, Corona stuff with boxes Pi too. Uh, that's the sad reality we had this year. There's a whole section for tools and sled walls. There's no good photos yet because I'm not that happy how this works out yet. The, the, um, the actual finished items are okay. They're, they're actually cool, but the problem is because um, the sled wall is actually meant to be, so the, the sled wall holders are meant to be stamped from steel. And so they are wide and strong and steel. And I have only basically those small hooks uh, made of thin plywood. And while they are able to hold the stuff up, they are easy to break, especially when you uh, install it or uninstall it. And it's easy for them to get snagged and then broken off. So I might change that to actually use uh, aluminum profiles to hook in there. So, yeah. but they're there. So there's uh, another section with, with parts and samples. Um, there's all kind of stuff that doesn't does pick good uh, pictures yet, but you can just uh, slide, uh, browse through there. Um, let's look at the time. We need to hurry up a bit. Uh, then there's a mix session, a misc session, which has all kind of other stuff. There's uh, an Agricola, Agricola insert that just got uh, um, donated by a contributor like a couple of one or two months ago. Um, on the top left, there is my uh, Makita Aku uh, based uh, power supply that makes use of a ch cheap Chinese uh, uh, bench power supply. Um, and there are all kinds of other things uh, that are in there. Then there are a couple of bigger things that use Box.py uh, for, for, uh, as a basis. One of them is uh, Flipper, my uh, um, cocktail robot. This was done basically to see with how little um, vitamins one can build a, a cocktail bot so it's, a, uh, it's able to use 15 bottles. And what it does is the top, the thing on top turns around and then pulls these levers to turn to tilt the bottles and then uh, pour stuff into ice and then it's got uh, pour uh, um, and go through the ice it gets out cooled and mixed and um, the, everything is done with only two stepper motors whose uh, uh, heat sinks you can see or the heat sinks of the drivers you can see on top 
Another thing is, is the Autobot we did a couple of years ago, which is basically just an integrated hinge box with legs. Um, we wanted to do this as a um, um, uh, as a um, as a project for kids, and original was three printed and three D printing such a thing takes one evening per robot, and now it takes like twelve or fifteen minutes. Then there's our rotary attachment, which probably still needs a bit of work and love. So there's now a section. A lot of there are a couple of people who do need uh, finger joints and stuff, and but don't want to go through the hassle actually programming a new generator. And so what they do is they just take some boxes and cut them into pieces with Inkscape, and then make something new out of that. Uh, and I are, will just want just to show a couple of examples so to get a feeling what 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 can be done. Um, don't ask me about the details because that's not what I do. But so um, there was uh, the, uh, the charging station for, for the Congress, I think two years ago, um, there's an um, useless machine which should, which should actually be a generator, but it, you could just also just combine two different boxes and have one. Um, and there's a Maslow type uh, uh, um, uh, milling machine that we are currently building that's also made out of um, uh, simple uh, pieces of, of boxes pie, heavily modified to be to be to be honest. So I will just uh, we're a bit of late. Um, we will skip uh, this part. Um, generally, if you design something. Um, it's important that that you make good use of the material and a way to get stiffness and strength is basically to enclose uh, volume that gets, gives gives the stuff strength and to keep all your forces within the walls. Um, uh, basically, the more boxy it is, the, the stronger and stiffer and, and, and better it is. I want to show here some detail of the of the Maslow machine, where you can see really nicely how how these um, um, how all the parts are basically trying to wrap around uh, the bolt they're holding or he or that, uh, and basically supporting the part from all directions. So whenever something needs to move, it needs to twist a whole wall within itself, which is of course not that easy. The thing is, wood is very is relatively flexible, so you need to get a stiffness and strength from um, from the form itself, and that's a good example how how this can be done, instead of just having like one wall that that attaches. So, if you're interested, you can also do your own generators. If you don't want to use the go down the Inkscape routes, um, there's some documentation that's linked on on the generator on, on the bottom. Um, uh, it might be worth asking for help first because I'm a lazy guy, so a lot of things can be done easily if you know how to do them. And if not, you there there's a long route that you probably want to avoid. Um, architectures. Uh, so so there. Are Although it's just um, turtle graphics, there are a lot of abstraction layers to make this uh, feasible. Um, so there's the top layer with, with the UIs, there are the generators, there's uh, code for, for handling the settings that also does all the, uh, and there are setting glasses for all those um, uh, edge types. Um, then there's a handful of, of parts that um, basically, that are basic shapes. They do have callbacks, so whenever you want need holes or features within uh, one of those walls, you have a callback to use, or you have a callback per edge you can use to put those in place. And there, are the main uh, um, work of the library is done by the edges, um, and so adding new a new edge type allows you to add features to the to the outside of some parts. And um, so a lot of things can be done easily by just 
trading new edge type and put it at the right place. And of the bot at the bottom are, of course, uh, drawing primitives if you really want to draw stuff on your own or use them to implement the edges. That's basically the very, very rough overview. Uh, there's some documentation that's worth looking at, or you can just ask me or open a ticket. Uh, happy lasering. Yeah, Chrissy, thanks for a nice talk. I hope uh, all the people could get some something out of it and uh, want to play around with that. Um, just one question at the end. Um, I have a answer from the Signal Angel. Um, there's, a, there's Douglas. He has a 3D printer for which a laser attachment is available for about 30 euros. It's, it has a violet laser with um, 500 milliwatts. Is this sufficient to cut wood? Um, let's say this is a dangerous toy. So it, this is just enough to damage your eyes. And I mean, you can probably cut paper with it. And if you're running it very, very long, it will cut through wood at some point, but it's really no point. So our laser cutter has 80 watts. And while it might not focus as well as a diode, it's... Um, <laughs> It's, it's probably, probably not, a not a good idea. And the thing, and is, the thing you really is, you really should have, should a, have a, closed a closed box, box around, around your laser. Your laser. And, and um, the box the should box not should let, let any of the laser, laser type you're using, using through. So the, so the CO2, CO2 laser, laser has the benefit that it doesn't go through. Uh, so a lot so of materials lot of are not transparent, are not transparent for the CO2, CO2 laser. laser. Um, but uh, uh, ultraviolet laser, laser is another story. story. So it will so probably go probably through go acrylic through and stuff like this. I really don't want UV lasers in your eye. And you won't, and you, you won't, won't be able, won't to, be have able to have fun with, with, with boxes like this. That, that, that won't work. There's a reason why our machine costed like three zeros more than that. Okay, okay thank you thank for you. the information. Um, that's it from the Q and A. For everyone here at a Remote Congress, I wish you nice. Nice, nice event. event.